Slurus, east of Johannesburg. An investigator from a major medical aid company is looking for Mr. Zolani Kakeka. Kakeka is a physiotherapist. In the last three years, he submitted claims to the medical aid for services rendered from these rooms. From the services he's claimed for, the investigator expects to find a treadmill, a traction machine, an ultrasound, a nebulizer and a laser machine in this room. She finds little more than an infrared lamp and some baby oil. The medical aid is acting on information that Kakeka runs a corrupt practice. For one thing, he tells people he's a medical doctor. For another, he's known as Mr. ATM around here. Yeah, night or the mother. Mm. I can only be able to solve the problem after eight days, not before. His scam is simple. If you're a medical aid member and you're a bit cash strapped, visit Kakeka. He'll take the details off your medical aid card, copy out several false invoices for services he never rendered to you, and claim from the medical aid. At the end of the month, when the medical aid has paid him out and you get your statement in the post, go back to Kakeka and he will give you a cut of the cash. The medical aide knows that Kakeka runs several consulting rooms and they track him down in the next suburb. Kakeka is visiting friends at a clinic opposite his own rooms in Katlehong when the investigator marches in to interview him. Marius Smith heads the Forensic Investigations Unit at Discovery Health. He started his career as a pharmacist. Today, he nurtures a personal crusade to rid the private healthcare sector of corruption. But the immediate target, a pharmacy that sells groceries on medical aid. Forensic investigators use the latest technology and undercover agents to follow up fraud tip-offs. Units like these exist at all the major medical schemes and administrators around the country. Forensic investigations for medical aid have become a multi-million rand undertaking in itself. 25% of adults will always lie, steal and cheat. 25% will never lie, steal and cheat. And the 50% that stats over can go either way. Now, the interesting thing is about that 50% is what determines where they go. One thing that may tilt the scales in favor of dishonesty is poverty. This pharmacy is located in a depressed, low-income area, Main Street, Newlands in Johannesburg. Few customers here have ready cash. That's why they're ready to collude with pharmacist Jules Bates. I was at first doubtful. I was doubting whether he would accept me because I had never been there before. But, you know, it was so smooth. I went to this lady who was at the counter, told her, pointed that I wanted baby powder, milk, some um, baby oil, then they put that on the counter. And then I said, this lady said, are you going to pay? I said, no, I haven't got cash. I drew out my medical aid uh, card. Then he said, okay, go over to that boss, go, pointed at the pharmacist. It's the investigator's second visit to the pharmacy. He wants to make sure that this is standard business practice for Jules Bates. Okay. And uh, I must add this. Hey. There's something that I will tell you which made me laugh inside, you know. What happened, there was this lady. She was standing next to me. She also had a card. So she waved the card to one of the assistants. And the assistants told the pharmacist that even this one has got a card. Jesus, you know what he said? He exclaimed and said... Oh, what a lucky day, you know. This time, the investigator even gets away with buying toilet paper, and he never pays a cent. Bates simply makes him sign an invoice for medication valued at roughly the same amount as the groceries he's taken. Bates submits his claims electronically. This means that on the other side of town, the investigators can detect his transactions almost immediately. Yep, this claim came in just now. SMX. 20, 20 BCMX tablets, yes. Yeah. 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 But you just print me a copy of, uh, you know, of the plan that has to come through that I can just keep it for records. Thanks. The claim amounts are not excessive. Bates explained to the investigators that he only wanted to help a few patients, not milk the medical aid dry. In truth, 
No one knows how long it took investigators to find out about Jules Bates. No one can say how much medical schemes lost in paying out fraudulent claims before they were able to stop funding to the pharmacy. The problem is, until now, investigators from different medical schemes never really talked to one another about their investigations. They never shared information on dodgy service providers or members. Fraudsters have continued to milk one medical scheme after the next. About 20% of the money we spend on private health care is lost to fraudulent and unethical practices. That's around 8 billion rand of our money every year. The, the industry itself is being so um, taken to the cleaners in many respects by, by providers who really are pushing healthcare costs out of all proportions. And, and in, by that I don't mean all providers. That's the sad part. It's only a small percentage of providers that do it. Um, and, but it, it nevertheless makes the cost of healthcare just totally unaffordable for the man in the street. What a medical scheme is about, it is about the, the healthy members subsidizing the, the ill members so that when you become either old or sick, that someone else will then subsidize your contributions again. Medical schemes survive and continue to pay out precisely because we don't all get the money back we put into it every year. Our relatively small contributions mean we have access to much larger funds. We can use these to pay extensive private health care rates if we get sick. It doesn't mean that whatever we put into the fund we must get out again. But some members feel it's unfair to keep paying monthly contributions if they never really get sick. That's why they get in cahoots with service providers to see if they can get their hands on money they feel is rightfully theirs, money they're otherwise unlikely to see again. Take what happens at this optometrist. Sci Vision is in an industrial area near Benoni on Johannesburg's East Rand. It's run by optometrist Dean Reddy. The undercover investigator walks in, sees a pair of designer sunglasses he'd really like, but medical aid doesn't cover sunglasses. Dean Reddy knows the rules perfectly well. The medical aid covers only prescription lenses for problem vision. So he's careful to take the patient into the examination room and go through the motions of an eye test. Okay. How is your general health? Any sugar, high blood pressure, cholesterol? Uh, so far it's just the flu. Just the flu, eh? Yeah. Nothing serious. Nah. No epilepsy, nothing. Never. You nah. get headaches? No. Distance nah. is fine. No operations, eh? Yeah, nothing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the investigator's health or eyesight. He just wants the trendy sunglasses in the display cabinet. Okay, we're looking at 1, 3, plus your 2, 1, 8, times 5%. There is a levy of about 200, 265. Do you want to pay the cash, which I don't mind, or do you want to, do you want me, you see, because normally by law with the medical aid, we're supposed to charge you that upfront. Yeah. You want to pay for that upfront, or must we try and recoup that from the medical aid? So what I will do, yeah. I will add, 218 plus 13500 plus 265. Yeah. We have to put in a claim for about 18, but okay. then it comes down to 1. Okay. You want me to do that? Yeah, no, I don't have You don't that. mind. Yeah, I don't so have that. Leave thing. this with me. What I will do is I'll try and put in your script because I must do that, or I'll try and keep it as original. It seems Reddy has no intention of tampering with the original sunglass lenses. But in order to trick the medical aid into paying, he must submit a phony prescription for corrective lenses to the medical aid call center. His inflated claim fraudulently includes the compulsory excess that a patient ought to pay in cash. Hi Lucy, my name is Dr. Reddy. I'm phoning from the Sci Vision Eye Clinic in Benoni. And can I get your claimed amount please? Uh, the full claimed amount, you, you don't want the breakdown. No, I need the full claim first and then I'll get the breakdown. 2561. 2561. I made a boo-boo with the calculation. <laughs> it's actually 2948. Okay. I'm sorry about that. But you know what I did for the tent? I only took it as one. One lens is 37, it was times two. Okay. That's where it came up. Yeah. Okay. Two, nine, four, 
right. Could you just hold for me while I post it? Sure, mate. Thank you very much. Reddy has now claimed an extra thousand rand over and above his and the patient's original claim. Special assignment returns to Reddy's practice independently to try and find out why he's knowingly conspired with a patient to defraud the medical aid. But the door gets locked and we must wait. Mr. Reddy, can I possibly speak to you but behind the door without the camera? Finally, he slips a note under the door. A throat infection means he can't speak today. We must come back tomorrow. Later, he declines to comment at all, saying in his defense that the patient forced him into committing fraud. He felt he had no choice. My mind has told me never to pressurize. If a person says, no, I'm not doing that, I leave it at that. I never have a second word with him. I know, I mean, I can't push him. If he's honest, he's honest. As organizations, we've got, a, we've got a right to protect our business interest. However, the perpetrators that we might be dealing with or the people that we might be investigating has also got certain fundamental rights, and we need to ensure that, that those rights are protected at all times. We cannot go overboard and do just what we want to do. Medical fraud is complex, and the industry's investigators have become specialists over the years. As little as five years ago, this office didn't even exist. Today, Discovery's forensic unit alone is 23 strong. Units like these are replicated throughout the industry. Medical fraud includes everything from outright fraud to over-servicing to kickbacks. All unethical practices are equally serious in the eyes of these industry investigators. And they investigate not only the providers, but also patients, even employees of the scheme, whoever may be tempted to step out of line. Members are, in some of them, in very desperate circumstances, desperately needing money. And if the, if the doctor down the street is actually giving you cash for, a, for your medical aid card, well then, perhaps that's your way to a pack of groceries for the month. Um, you know, so I think one has to be realistic as to why it's actually grown so big and, and why it's so out of proportion. All administrators have fraud investigation programs that is an absolute duplication of one another and obviously duplication of cost because everybody's doing their own thing in their own manner and if we pull together we can actually take those providers and those members out of the system. Taking fraudsters out of the system is an impossible task for individual medical schemes working in isolation. That's why for the first time there's now a plan to pool resources. All information on members and providers from different schemes is put into one huge database. Trends can now be analyzed scientifically and problem members and practitioners identified. Uh, I, I like to believe that, that uh, the, the fraud environment is a piece of common ground in a very complex, very competitive industry where we can all get together and address a problem that, that will have two effects. First of all, addressing cost and secondly, addressing the quality of care that's been given to the consumer or the patient at the end of the day. Everyone around this table represents a medical scheme or administrator. They're looking for collective ways of dealing with fraud perpetrators. Uh, we need to agree to a policy, mm. and, and I'm sure most of us have some policies in place. So if it's civil action in terms of taking the money back, um, you know, the typical professional action reporting to the Health Professions Council, and in the criminal action, based on the evidence that we would have, you'd be obliged to report that as well. Is there anything that could prevent us from actually, from, from immediately stopping payment? Because it can happen just like that. I mean, it happens that one afternoon that the guy was getting payment from all these administrators and the next day he gets nothing. So it's quite, it's quite onerous um, and I think would be great if we, if, if, if we were, were able to, to go that far. I think as, as an industry we're going to have to, I mean, we have to make decisions based on accurate documentation. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have to be bold. At the end of the day, if we're not going to make a stance as a group, we're going to never sort this thing out. The Joint Industry Forensic Management Unit represents a major breakthrough in the war on fraud. If a practitioner is now found to have acted unethically or patients abuse their medical aid, the companies can cut funding all together and all at once. This could be extremely bad news for a practitioner like Dr. Darwood from Makadu in the Lipopo province. The forensic unit has been tipped off that Dr. Darwood gives non-claimable drugs to patients and then claims legitimate medication. 
And I told the doctor that I was, I coughed at night and I sort of thought I had um, felt I had some flu. He didn't even bother to examine me. No stethoscope, nothing, no probing. He just went to discovery. Just check with his funds for his wife. Did you not claim? No, I did not claim. I was sure you. I forgot about it actually. The investigator came here once before on the pretext of flu. In reality, he was probing a complaint that Dr. Dar would give slimming tablets on medical aid. Medical schemes don't cover cosmetic aids like slimming drugs, but the investigator said he wanted duramine for his overweight wife. Well, he looked at me and said, Duramine, has she used that before? I said, probably because, yeah, I had a piece of paper where Duramine was scribbled. He looked at it and said, yeah, okay, I'll help her. Yeah, the, the problem is uh, I try to run a, a very clean practice. Okay. Duramine, the medical aid, don't pay for it. Yeah, yeah. You've got to pay cash. Okay. I go to now punch in something yeah. to make up. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. Now, I don't like to do like what, you are, what you're asking me to do, because I don't know if your wife, for example, has consulted somebody. Okay. You understand? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm going to claim today that you are here today for yeah. your wife. Yeah. And you are signing for it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm safe that yeah. you sign, everything is. Yeah. There's no problem. Uh, problem, right? But there is a problem. Despite saying he doesn't like to do it, Dawood has already claimed payment for the first batch of Duramine the investigator took. I'll, uh, you phone me. I'll phone them to tell them you are coming. It only takes one fraudulent action to give a medical scheme the right to stop funding a patient or a practitioner. Besides this transaction and the complaint that led investigators here in the first place, it's impossible to say how many times Dr. Dawood has made his patients sign blank invoices. A blank invoice gives Dr. Darwood carte blanche to claim money from the medical aid. To cover the slimming drugs he gave to the investigator's wife, he claimed medicine for ringworm. All that remains now is to inform Dr. Darwood that the scheme will stop funding his practice forthwith. He declines the special assignment invitation to put his side of the story on camera. Now that one medical scheme has stopped funding Dr. Darwood, all others will have to consider the evidence and see if they too need to take action. Katlehung, east of Johannesburg. Ivy Sikobu is not a healthy woman. Until two years ago, she was a dependent on her husband's medical aid. But rising premiums meant he could no longer afford to pay for her. Then she was sent to a physiotherapist. Kakeka didn't know that Ivy had been taken off her husband's medical aid. Kakeka just took Alfred Makoba's old medical aid details from the referring doctor and tried to submit nine claims in husband and wife's names. It was easy for the medical aid to detect Kakeka's fraud. The person he tried to claim for wasn't even a member of the scheme. But Mr. ATM usually works hand in hand with his patients, so it's been very difficult to crack which claims are real and which ones not. I, I do recall that you requested about three to four hundred rand. The forensic management unit sent in a probe once they'd been alerted. Everything else stays the same. The investigator asked for cash because it had been a difficult month. Uh, 
Kakeka claimed the patients requested 300 rand and much more. At the forensic investigations department, his claims streamed in. For the two consultations the investigator had, Kakeka copied nine invoices. The total claim amount is over 2,000 rand. He claims for expensive things like nebulizers, treadmills, traction machines, ultrasounds and laser, all used on a perfectly healthy man. To top it all, when the investigator goes to fetch his ATM withdrawal, Kakeka gives it to him in check form, with check. his name and practice number boldly on display. From his practice account. Gee, that's quite brave. Excellent, man. Mm -hmm. uh, what, did he say anything, anything about the amount or anything? No, no, no. I mean, considering that he it, so he didn't make any mention of the amount. No. Okay. But this is great. Thanks a lot for the, for the, for the work today. Huh? Anytime. Keep well. I'll talk to you again. Anytime. Great, sir. Ngizibeka <laughs> If it's up to the medical schemes represented around this table, it will soon become impossible for anyone to even consider trying to get away with fraud. We're able to see as an industry how providers perform. For instance, just a very simple example, you can't possibly have a doctor seeing 500 patients a day, for, for example. But if you see that in your, within, when you pool your data and you see that he is actually billing for 500 patients per day, well then you know that there's, the, the, the public is being and the schemes are being ripped off. You get the halo effect eventually and the guys who might take a chance are less likely to take a chance. So your poor criminal will still be there and there will still be some fraud with your poor criminal. But the guys who were taking a chance before and got away with one or two lucky claims are not going to do it because if we're taking action, people are either going to jail or they're being dismissed from council or they're you know, disbarred. Um, and ultimately, they're on a list with all of us and we all aren't going to pay them. It's a new plan for an old problem. And in true South African style, it's about talking and working together. And already the message seems to be spread.